Welcome to section 4.17 to 4.18, where we're going to start out discussing things more from a human perspective on genetics uh, as we get closer to approaching actual human traits and human disorders. Now to start off with humans, we might as well discuss the Human Genome Project, because this was a big project, international, where a bunch of scientists went through and took, I believe, five people, and they analyzed all three billion nucleotides that they possess. Every adenine, every thymine, every cytosine, every guanine. And the purpose of this was they wanted to figure out all the genes that we have so that they could start analyzing, hopefully, what each of these genes does so we get to know ourselves better and how we function. So perhaps in the future, we can do something with that knowledge to help things. One of the other things that they found besides how many genes we have is they were to look at the differences between individuals to try to figure out what was going on. And they could find that most of our genes do have more than one allele, not all. So what this meant was there was differences where you could see it's not like there's one type of hair color, for instance. There's multiple different alleles, at least two for most traits. Uh, so individuals were not identical. And so this arose much of the variation that there was between the individuals that they studied. Now the other idea is, is they were able to really discuss this idea of a genome, and that's going to be the totality of the genetic info or opportunities within either an individual it's sometimes applied to or within a species. And so they're really trying to look at what options that humans have, and eventually if we get more and more data, we can get really a sense of what genes are at our disposal as mankind to use as we adapt and evolve to our environment as it changes. They also went into this assuming that most of the DNA that was part of our genome was ultimately worthless. Like there's called junk DNA where probably 80% of our DNA or perhaps even more when we went into this, they saw it was like lots of repeats where it just kind of went on and on with the same type of nucleotide or the same sequence of nucleotides. And so it appeared to have no purpose. And so they thought it's junk. But then now as time has gone on, as we get more information and more technology, we keep finding that many of these sequences, probably most of them, do seem to have some purpose. It may not be making a protein. Uh, it may not be one of the most obvious ways of regulating, like some of the stuff that we've seen that directly regulates stuff, but it does seem to play a regulatory role, whether it's binding something, whether it's shifting something so it can bind to something else. And so we're finding more and more of what used to be considered junk does have a purpose. And so anymore when we talk about junk DNA, we don't say it's useless, we just say it's DNA that has no known use currently. And then lastly, there's this idea that our chromosomes are going to be DNA that's wrapped around proteins called histones. All right? This helps us compact it when needed. Now the genes are going to be sections of that DNA. You can see over here, these are some disease-causing genes. This is chromosome 19, a smaller one. So this is listing just these disease-causing genes, not the other genes. And so you can see there's quite a few genes on just this one chromosome. And you can also remember that each gene has its own particular spot, its own particular location where you'll always find that gene, one of its alleles, present there. And so it gives you the sense that a chromosome is the larger package. So like this jar is like the chromosome. The genes, which most chromosomes contain probably on the order of hundreds to thousands of genes, they're the items that are kind of packaged in it as sections of that DNA molecule that it contains. So that one big giant DNA molecule, you can think the genes would be like each individual sentence. So if that one big piece of DNA is like a book, each sentence would be a gene, and it has a specific spot in the book. Now when it comes to human chromosomes, there's two big types. Autosomes, which are the ones that don't really call for you being male or female. They just take care of your normal functions that you need. And we, we number these ones pretty easy. We just say chromosome 1 is the largest one. And it's a pair because you have one that's from mom and one that's from dad. So you've got two of them. And then for humans, because we have 22 pairs, the smallest chromosome would just be referred to as chromosome 22. And once again, we'd have two of those. We'd have one from mom, one from dad. Now beyond our autosomes, we've got sex chromosomes. Now sex chromosomes will make up the other two chromosomes needed to get us to 46, which is the magic number for humans. And so we have a X chromosome, which is large, contains a couple thousand genes. And then we've got the Y chromosome, which contains about 100. It's very small. It really just contains stuff that's needed to make you be male. And so the upshot of this, if you're male, you have an X and a Y. The X because you need it to live, because it contains a lot of genes that don't just code to be female, they code to live. 
And then the Y, gene, or the y chromosome, which contains the SRY gene, which I always call the SARI gene, uh, that ultimately is the one that makes you develop into a male uh, while you're in the womb developing. Now females will just have two X's. The upshot of this is they can't choose the gender of the baby. Only the male can based upon which sperm, whether it has an X or a Y, fertilizes the egg. The egg will always have an X from mom. And mom also only needs one of her X's to work, right? Males get by with one X, so can females. So the upshot of this is they will ultimately leave one of their X chromosomes as a chromosome, and we call it a bar body. So it's kind of like if I give you two packages of something, and you open one up, and you use it, and you leave the other one in the package. Why open up the package when you don't need to? So they just leave the second X chromosome packaged up as a chromosome, uh, rather than actually using it. Now, humans happen to use this XYXX system, but I just want to briefly make sure you realize that this is not the only system. Birds use something similar, except they use Zs and Ws. And their main difference is that males are ZZ, so they can't affect the ultimate gender of the child, whereas the females are ZW, so they are the ones that ultimately choose what the gender will be based on which they give. And then other things can get even crazier. Uh, insects, this isn't even that crazy, but grasshoppers, XX would be female, and just a single X with no Ys or anything would be male. There's lots of other things that we'll discuss in, cl in class, but I just want to make sure you don't think that the mammalian human way is the only way that there is.